All right, welcome back to Quest for Faith with Brian. And today I have a really special guest, Gordon Crow, and he has a fabulous YouTube channel and ministry called Mass Transit. And Gordon and I uh, had a great conversation a few weeks ago, and I was like, "We, I have to have him on my channel." And, and uh, Gordon, I'm really excited to have you on today, and uh, and looking forward to this conversation. Me, me too. Particularly with our <clears throat> somewhat shared background and all, and uh, both being converts, uh, I, I feel like where's the where's the cradle Catholic to supervise us? But I think we'll get through it. <laughs> Yeah, we'll be all right. We'll be all right there. <laughs> okay. Amen to that. All right, great. So I wanted to kind of start off with just uh, your early faith background, um, uh, how you grew up, and uh, we can kind of die, go through that and what led you to the Catholic Church eventually, and we'll kind of go through that story first. So, um, where where did you grow up? What faith background did you have when you were when you were growing up in your younger years? Yeah, well, I. Uh... Born and raised in Southern California, Orange County. Uh, four brother, three brothers and a sister, four boys and a girl, Jim and Midge Crow. Uh, my mom and dad uh, met at George Pepperdine College. It was uh, uh, where they met. Mom was an admin there. My dad was a student. He got off the boat after the big war in San Diego and came up to, Cal up to L.A. to go to college on the GI Bill, met my mom. And they started popping out kids. As you know, uh, Pepperdine, which you, I'm sure you already knew, it's a Church of Christ college. And that's what yep. I was raised in, the Churches of Christ, same as you. Uh, very <clears throat> fundamentalist uh, church, gorgeous, wonderful, beautiful, loving people. I was raised with the uh, love of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit was instilled in me from, from day one. Uh, grew up uh, down there in Southern California, eventually uh, left uh, joined the military active duty uh, out of high school and traveled around for a couple of years on that and then came back and ended up moving to the Northwest, um, married with a child, uh, ended up in, in the Tri-Cities area of Washington and eventually up to Spokane, ended up getting a divorce and uh, moving over to taking a job in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, and that's where uh, uh, my life uh, took off. I, I worked there for a number of years and as a as a, uh, in a marketing position. Uh, eventually I was hired as the business editor of the local daily newspaper there. And I did that for about three years. <clears throat> and then the uh, uh, local uh, party uh, drafted me to run for the state Senate. It ran for the state Senate. I was a state Senator for three terms in the Idaho state Senate. Wow. <laughs> uh, I was remarried by then. We had adopted a new son, Andrew, who's now 31. He'll be 31 this year. Um, told my wife when I ran that uh, when she wanted me to stop running, I'd stop running. And in 2000, she says, don't run for re-election. So, so I didn't. I followed yeah, her yeah. Uh, her request on that. She was Lutheran, by the way. Uh, I'd left Churches okay. of Christ. And uh, when I married Sandy, we got married by a Lutheran pastor in an Episcopal church in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And, but I, I adopted the Lutheran faith and, and it was that for about 30 years. Um, so when you Got were growing this. up real, real quick, let's, uh, so I guess, so until you met your, your second wife, were you still going to church of Christ or, um, you know, I, I, no, no, I was, you know, when my first marriage started falling apart, I went to a couple other, uh, uh, Protestant denominations. And then I really wasn't churched for a few years. Um, I always believed, I always believed in God. I talked to God and Christ quite a bit, uh, petitioned the Holy Spirit pretty regularly. My life was kind of miserable at the time. Um, and uh, then when I met Sandy and she had a faith, she was committed to the Lutheran Church, started going there. Uh, originally, she went to the Missouri Synod Church and uh, in Coeur d'Alene. Her parents were charter members at an ELCA church in, in Coeur d'Alene, so we ended up going there. And okay. we were members there for a number of years um, on that. Um, I, my the hard wiring of Church of Christ was always in me, still yeah. is to a certain extent. Yep. You know those uh, doesn't those, leave uh, guitar strings twang loud. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's it's really interesting uh, when you've grown up with a faith background like that, and right. you do see it kind of 
color a lot of the the ways that you that you even think about your faith um and, and i think even for me it played just a massive role because the bible had to be first it was, like i had to find everything about catholicism mm -hmm. in scripture um but but i mean for, for you growing up uh so your parents met at pepperdine and then you're in orange county and i know there's some there's some decent pockets of church of christ down in southern california <laughs> that uh, it's yeah. It's not as crazy as, as Texas and Kentucky and, uh, and other uh, yeah. parts of the country, but there is some decent pockets. And yeah. um, and I, I think one of the things that always um, I, I think you, you touched on just a, a great people to be around. And mm -hmm. that was my experience generally growing up. Um, it, it was uh, very family oriented, um, mm -hmm. going to church three times a week. Uh, was yeah. that kind of your experience too? Yeah, absolutely. Twice on Sunday, Wednesday nights. And then when I became a teenager, there was youth group activities on, on, on top of that. I, one thing I experienced, I don't know if it was the same for you, but thinking about it, when I was on another show being interviewed, I thought, you know, until my mid-teens, until I kind of emancipated myself and kind of, you know, started wandering a little bit, um, all of our friends were Church of Christ. Yeah. We had friends in the block in the neighborhood that we'd associate with, but the parties and the and the Christmas things and the Fourth of July stuff was all Church of Christ members that we hung out with and and uh, pretty much dominated uh, our lives uh, were the members of the church and, and they were great. Uh, I'm not complaining about it, um, but very uh, stringent, as you know, mm -hmm. um, very resolute in the belief in that the Church of Christ was the one true church. I had somebody yeah. ask me once if. Uh, if you're raised to be anti-Catholic, and I know a lot of Church of Christ people were, I I don't recall having been raised to be anti-Catholic as much as I was raised to believe that, or I came to believe uh, that anybody right. who wasn't Church of Christ wasn't making the wasn't making wasn't the doing it right. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so I, I had no animus towards any non-Church non. Uh, church of Christ Church. I just thought the poor souls. You know, we got to get them into the it's the right mm -hmm. church, but. So I went along with that. I tried, I would even, uh, my first marriage was in a four square church, um, which is really wild compared to even church of Christ and Catholic. Yeah. They're, you know, they're kind of Pentecostal and, mm -hmm. and the speaking in tongues and things that kind of had me scratching my head every Sunday. Uh, but I went there seeking the faith, I think seeking God, um, church of Christ, uh, still looms large in my life. I, my, next youngest brother uh, he lives nearby we winter in texas for a few months down here before we hit the road again and he uh he's an elder or deacon at their church of christ here their preacher there uh, their minister there and i became good friends he's gone to arkansas to take another job um and my relationship with the members of the church of christ including my own family is really comfortable for them and me they just never bring it up if yeah they bring up uh they bring up a topic. Uh, you and I have talked. I've, I've, I've come to you about the 400-year silence uh, in the prophets and the Apocrypha. And, and uh, um, they just don't bring up that. that might, you know, I had a relative who brought that up, and they're sorry they did now because I've studied up on it. <laughs> so, right. Uh, uh, they just avoid the topic altogether. They, they, were, they were pretty disillusioned. I don't know if that, that's not a good word. They were, they were pretty disappointed when I became Lutheran. Yeah. Um, and and now that I'm Catholic, I thought Lutheran wasn't too bad by comparison. I feel, but, I feel like my family is the same way because they were not happy when we started going to a Methodist church at all. Yeah. And so uh, jumping to Catholicism was just like the worst thing I yeah. could do. And, and you're yeah. right. Like they don't want to talk about it. And my family doesn't. Like, and I want to talk about it because it's yeah. I mean, come on, I got a YouTube channel. I'm always talking about it. It's always on yeah. the forefront of my mind is my faith. And, uh, yeah. And, and yeah, it's, um, it, they never want to engage. And then they're always shocked when I come back with theological discussions right. and they're like, wait, right. You're and making they say, sense. They and then they want to change the subject. The potatoes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, God, and I just pray for him constantly. I have a, I have a list of, uh, people I pray for every day. There's about 60 people on there now for the devotions and prayers I do every morning and every member of my family's on there. Um, and, and pray Good that the you. spirit moves on them and brings them into the one true the holy questions. and apostolic Catholic church. And, and yeah, yeah. Just, or, 
either if you're not going to make me a resource for them or a bridge for them, make sure I'm not a, a, a tripping Hindrance. block for them. Or, yeah, yep. 100%. Yep. So that, that time uh, in between before you met your wife and you're kind of stumbling around with your faith, I mean, I, I, I did go through a period like that myself where mm-hmm. um, it was just having a rough, rough time in life. And uh, I, I didn't really start leaving the Church of Christ until... Uh, how old was I? I don't know. Uh, I was late twenties, early thirties, mm-hmm. um, is when I finally was just, I, I couldn't handle it anymore. Um, mm-hmm. but, but it was interesting for me because I always still felt the call to go to church. I always felt God, mm-hmm. like you should be going to church. Um, and, but mm-hmm. I, you know, it was having that, that really struggle of trying to get myself to do that. Uh, d- was that kind of your experience during that period of time? It was until I got married and started going to Lutheran church full time. I went from, you know, I, I joke, um, but it, the joke will land with you. I used to, I, I used to tell people that I was raised in a church that thought the only unforgivable sin was all of them. And yeah. <laughs> 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 and then I went from that and ended up in ELCA uh, Lutheran, <laughs> which was uh, the epitome of hyper grace. They still are. Eventually, um, the uh, modern maladies and, and, and challenges that are coming to all these Protestant churches landed at ELCA. And they started uh, ordaining uh, uh, people that didn't need to be ordained. They yep. were already ordaining women, uh, which I always just swallowed and accepted. Um, but, but then people with lifestyles that are inappropriate and, and started, I remember in our Lutheran church, once, uh, we had a big congregational meeting in the, in the nave, in the, in the main part of the church and it was full of people. I was one of a small minority who opposed the ordination yeah. and certain moves that they were making. And the pastor called me out. I didn't expect this, but he said, uh, Gordon, you oppose this. And he looks from the pulpit up at the altar and points at me. He says, you you oppose this, but you've been divorced and remarried. And God said, that's a sin too. And I said, pastor so-and-so, that's correct. But I'm not organizing a bunch of Lutherans to say it, to come together now and say that it's not a sin and that yeah. it is okay. And, and, and Ooh, that's a good that was answer kind of off the top difference. of your head. Kind of pushed me aside from it, you know, and so this is the way they're born. And I said, well, to be frank, I'm with original sin. I'm born wanting to pay attention to more than my wife. And yeah. so, but I don't because I know, because one, I love my wife and two is I love God and he doesn't want me doing that. So there's all sorts of natural inclinations we're born with. I don't want to get into that debate. Here, yeah. yeah. But, uh, so ELCA, um, I can remember a dear, dear friend, Paul in Idaho, North Idaho, Coeur d'Alene driving back from a, regional conference with the ELCA from Spokane back over to Cord Lane and just both of us so distraught um, over the direction the church was going in. Uh, interestingly, uh, we both left ELCA. Uh, when I left uh, um, Minnesota some years later, uh, we went to uh, Wyoming where I took a job with the Chamber of Commerce there in Laramie, Wyoming. Ended up finding one of the LCMC, one of the breakaway uh, denominations within a Lutheran church. Ended up going to that church, um, much more fundamental in their point of view on things. Obviously, they broke away from the LCA because of those political, social, political issues at the time. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I uh, jumping to the towards the conversion here, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. We're both yeah. former Church of Christ. We could probably go on for days talking about yeah. The, uh, great stories from them, but uh, I, I cast my net. I had uh, started in nonprofits with the chamber there, and it turns out I was pretty good at running the chamber. So I kind of thought, well, I'll cast my net out there. And I set resume, res- resumes around the U.S., got a bunch of calls back, ended up down in Houma, Louisiana, um, interviewing for a job for the county chamber of commerce there, running that. They hired me and brought me down. And uh, I'm just going to do the cliff notes on this, and you can come back and yeah. talk me through what you want to know. But uh, I got down there and realized that about 60% of the county, the parish, they called it, yep. about 60% of the parish was Catholic, and about 80% of my board were Roman Catholic. And I was down there four or five months ahead of my wife, head of Sandy, 
And I said, well, I better learn something about Catholicism. I knew nothing about Catholicism, had not been exposed to any part of it, not yeah. the beautiful stuff or not the controversial, controversial stuff um, on that. So I started reading and I started watching a lot of videos. I started listening to Ave Maria radio and watching uh, EWTN and other shows on TV, just trying to pick up on this. And little by little, no surprise to you, it starts saying, oh my goodness, this makes sense. Yeah. This makes a lot of sense. And the, uh, the, the tripwire for me was on a Saturday, they were having a uh, Catholic convention at the convention center in uh, Homa. And I remember driving by it back to my apartment and seeing all these cars. I said, holy cow, I got a lot of Catholics here. This is a, this is amazing. And it's old uh, French territory. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was college students that were there. And, yeah. uh, I was listening to a radio station, Ave Maria radio with a, uh, uh, they were interviewing, I think it was a rebroadcast of a TV interview, uh, that this gentleman did. You probably know him too, uh, famous for having been a convert to the Catholic church after being a minister in the church of Christ, Bruce Sullivan, I believe lives yep. in Kentucky now. Yep. And I, He's a deacon I, now. I remember listening. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah. I remember listening to him, uh, through the whole interview. I was driving around town on a Saturday by myself. And I remember I was going by that convention center, seeing all those cars. I remember him. Well, first off he was talking and you'll, you'll appreciate this, um, in a vernacular using words that I understood from church of Christ mm -hmm. and, and terms and, and framing thoughts and thinking in a way that was familiar to me. Cause that was what I was raised with. And I used to joke until I met you, um, that I thought we were the only members of the Church of Christ who didn't have a Southern accent uh, because <laughs> he's definitely has a, his Kentucky accent there. Yep. And so it just it just struck home with me. And at one point, I thought I heard him say, uh, the interviewer says, what, what was the final straw that brought you into the church? And I thought I heard him say, you know, I decide, I asked myself, if, if the Catholic Church isn't the church that Christ established on Peter, why would I not want to be a member? And I remember thinking, that's profound. If this is the church, that Jesus established on Peter, why wouldn't I want to be a member? Yeah. And I remember driving back to my apartment probably two or three weeks late, two or three weeks later, it was a Monday morning. I was heading to, to my office it was less than a quarter mile away. I remember where I was on this turn going around this golf course. And I remember thinking, I believe it. Yeah. And Brian, it was, it was the Holy spirit. Um, you know, I know you read the church fathers and I know you read a lot of history. Um, my conversion was was so simple and so comparatively uh juvenile <laughs> compared to a lot of other people who have done all this heavy lifting and all this heavy study because once i once i believed that i just had to walk through that little door yeah. into the catholic church and you know people talk about how big the catholic church was when they're studying it well i didn't see that until i walked through that little door i was like Holy moly, look at this place. This is massive. And, and well, the, I think and I think a few things there. I mean, I wouldn't say it's yeah. juvenile at all because I mean, obviously the Holy Spirit was guiding you. I mean, God got you that job down there. And then all <laughs> yeah. of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I'm around Catholics. I've never been around Catholics my entire life, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have no idea. And and just the fact that it was probably a number of things, right? You're you're listening to you're like, I gotta figure these people out because I'm gonna mm -hmm. be in relationships with 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 these, I got to work with, with these individuals. And obviously their faith right. is big because I, the, even the fact that you knew that they were mostly Catholic, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that shows that they're living their faith. Mm -hmm. And so then under like going, well, okay, well, what is their faith? Like, how am I going to relate to these individuals? And then starting to listen to, I mean, there's so many great resources and, and mm -hmm. the coming home network, which is, I think that broadcast that they were, uh, I, mm -hmm. I've watched that one. I think I watched it two or three times and bought his book and read it too with, with, uh, with, with, uh, with Deacon Sullivan there. And, um, I mean, it, it was working on you that whole time. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't a, 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 a switch that flipped. And I mean, I don't know how many months do you think that was, that that was, uh, going on before your wife moved down there or was your wife well, down there I, yet? No, no, no. I think she followed me down like the next month. Okay. Maybe it was my second month down that this happened. And then three months later, I went to New Orleans and picked her up on a Saturday, brought her back to Homa. Um, was she like, I'm never leaving you again? 
<laughs> when I leave you, you well, leave the, the Lutheran faith. Just kidding. But <laughs> yeah, the funny story was is uh, um, I picked her up at the church. Between that and her coming down, uh, it became quite obvious. Uh, but let me back up. When I first took the job, her brother was a big in the restaurant industry in the South and the East Coast. And <laughs> excuse me, he, he Sandy, so I was taking the John and job in home. I run to the Chamber of Commerce and. Her brothers told her, and she repeated to me, they never hire out of the area. They always hire their own people. It's kind of remarkable that they would hire him. And uh, uh, so they always, you know, they always hire local or people that know the South. And New Orleans is, a, you know, Louisiana is such a wonderful place. I think I've said before, they're the nicest, kindest, uh, most pleasant, least healthy people on the face of the earth. They're just yes. wonderful. <laughs> and I just very, adore it to this very to this if day. Any of you yeah. have never been to Louisiana, that is a great description of oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't think I knew Texas for so long. I knew a lot of Louisiana. Yes. And yeah. 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 The uh I, I've often said um jokingly, uh Mother Church, I'm not serious about this. If I ever became suicidal, I would fly to New Orleans, meet myself to death, and die happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the best food on the face of the earth, but nice people. Anyway, um, at odds with my employer, turns out her brother was right. It was God who got me that job down there, like you said, and took me down there for this. Um, I, it was, it, I didn't like the job. I wasn't a good employee. And so before my wife got there, I decided this isn't going to work. And so I picked her up at the New Orleans airport. We're driving 40 minutes back to Homa and, uh, she said, well, how's it going? What's happening? Blah, blah, blah. So I got two big announcements. And she goes, what's that? <laughs> and and uh, I, I said, well, the first one is, is uh, I shouldn't have taken this job. It's not the right job. It's not working out. I'm going to have to leave. Um, you know, they uh, they thought I was the right person. I thought I was the right person. It turns out we were both wrong. And uh, so I'm not going to stick around. She's like, oh, my gosh. And, you know, that took a good 20 minutes on the drive for her to regain her breath Process and that pulse yeah and time skills well what's the next thing and you need to understand that that sandy and her her family and her family's family and their family and their relatives and their i mean they're going back generations are all lutheran mm -hmm. and uh staunch lutheran i mean they they i think some of them think that martin luther was was norwegian you know that's where they all came from yeah and uh and and just staunch lutheran and we were so active in the lutheran church uh, even after we left ELCA, we we're very active in our little uh, LCMC church we went to, uh, drove miles to every Sunday. And we were very committed Lutherans. When I worked for, I worked for a major corporation and that brought me to Minnesota. And there were people from the, from my, our Lutheran church that would see me walking down the hall, coming towards them. And they'd dive into another office or something to avoid me because they knew I was going to talk about how great our faith was. <laughs> and say, are we lucky to be Lutheran and all that? And, haven't seen you in church in a month, you know, Yeah. but uh, yeah. so she's that Lutheran. And she said, what's the next thing? And I said, well, I'm going to become a Catholic. And she, uh, she was in shock. All of a sudden it didn't matter that I'm moving her 2000 miles uh, for nothing. Uh, she, I think she wanted to jump out the window. What? And uh, just went on from there. Um, it, that was not a good scene. And our son who was uh football player in college uh, who was a general studies major because he planned on going to Lutheran seminary uh, after uh, college wasn't happy with me either. Uh, I and, can imagine. Uh, yeah. Cutting to the chase, uh, cutting to the end. Um, I got to the point where one day I was just uh, uh, heard somebody say about give, give the parenting of your children over the blessed mother. And so I did that in a prayer. I said, I said, Mary parent him lead him to, to your son's church. And I did the same thing with my wife. And uh, again, the, the 2014, I was received into the church in 2017, our son was in 2019, our, my wife uh, entered the Catholic church. And so we're all there now, wow. which is kind of neat. But uh, that was my conversion. Again, real simple. All the, all the challenges that I was confronted with, I came in with Mary, with the Eucharist, um, and transubstantiation and with uh, the authority of the church and with tradition, all that, all of that wasn't easy to be confronted with. But Brian, my answer was simple, said, oh, this really bugs me. But this is the church that Christ established yeah. on Peter. And so I was able to kind of 
bulldog my way through those and get through those. And it's getting easier. Yeah. And I think, I more. yeah, for me, it was, I, I completely understand. And that's living by faith, you mm -hmm. know, um, because, you know, I, I hate seeing a lot of, um, individuals exploring the Catholic faith and like, wow, this is real. This is real. And I'm not completely convinced. And, but they believe in 95% of the core Catholic doctrines. And there's one little thing that's holding them up. And, and for me, it was probably Mary. That was the one that I was like, okay, I believe in the, uh, the, the Pope's the, the real deal. Uh, the Eucharist is the real deal. Um, this is a church that Christ, Christ uh, established. Um, I don't know what to do with Mary yet. But that's the one I'm going to just go, okay, let, let, I'll just keep going. And, you know, it eventually worked out, right? I mean, it, it was fine. But I, I think that's a lot of times I think we get stuck in our own head. And that's why I think your conversion story is awesome because it was your heart and the Holy Spirit leading you. And your head wasn't in the way yet. And and which is amazing. Um, I was blessed beyond any reason uh, coming to the church. I, I called the Catholic church up the road, which turned out to be the cathedral uh, for the diocese. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think like... I, I want to learn more about being a Catholic. And uh, they hooked me up uh, with Paul, uh, who uh, was the, he, he kind of ran all the DREs, all the directors of religion education in the diocese. And uh, he also ran the, uh, RCIA classes, they still called it then up at the cathedral. So we talked on the phone, he invited me to, he said, you're a businessman. He said, come up to these Tuesday classes and uh, we'll get you. We kind of started already for this next Easter, but we'll get you in there now and uh, fast track you up. And I went to two or three uh, Tuesdays and Paul came into my office one day and said, Gordon, we just love having you there. You're just such an addition. He says, but you have so much energy and so many questions and and so much you want to learn he says you just you got more energy than this class can handle and uh and he said let's start doing this one-on-one -on -one. so brian for six months essentially i had one-on-one -on -one rcia that is head guy fantastic in the he said, oh i'm so yeah. jealous when i hear uh, that I mean, from other people you know <laughs> uh, i mean i thoroughly yeah. enjoyed my rcia class it was great and we yeah. had a fairly large class so um, it was yeah. a lot of fun to meet, uh, to be on the journey with that many different people. Um, but to yeah. do it one-on-one -on -one and get to really dive in deep oh. and, and have those deep conversations would just be yeah. just amazing. Yeah, it was huge. Paul is such a good guy. Um, he actually came in when, when we decided to move back to Minnesota, he came and helped us load our U-Haul and worked with us and all, and just a great guy. I'd also joined before, before I decided this was the church that Christ established on Peter, I, I was uh, vocal music is kind of my background. I'm a huge lover of choral music. I joined a choir, um, uh, outstanding choir there, um, where most people were from 30 to 60 years old um, in the choir, and they sang at the cathedral uh, for special events. We did the uh, uh, the in investiture, whatever you call it, when they brought in a new bishop, we sang there, and then other special masses we'd sing there. And most of the choir was Catholic, and uh, one of the older couples there kind of adopted me. And then when they heard I was coming to church, they were overjoyed. Uh, but I had a few uh, rather mystical experiences, hard to explain experiences. And, and them and my wife believed this. And we believe this, this happened. I, said, I don't know. I don't know. But they, they kind of convinced me. On that. that kind of helped me through that part uh, of the story, uh, uh, which was a huge help uh, on that. Um, they were both cradle Catholics. Their, their sons are priests. They have one son who's a priest and a son who's a nun. Our daughter who's a nun. Um, and, uh, and we so, don't uh, that way they, they were just wondering. Thank God. Yeah, we no, can't change, yeah, we can't no, change no, the no. church. Yeah, no, they uh, they were wonderful. So I had all these elements that God was sending to me. I did end up leaving the job. Uh, they were happy. I was happy. Took a job back up in uh, uh, Marshall, Minnesota, is where we'd left Marshall, or Minnesota from years before. Actually, I took a job running the foundation for a Catholic hospital. A okay. regional hospital there. Went back up. Last two or three months of RCA was at the church there um, in Marshall, Minnesota, Holy Redeemer Catholic Church. Uh, Father Paul Wolf uh, was the priest, uh, very uh, upstanding, uh, very regal kind of fellow, born and raised in Minnesota, and been a diocesan priest his whole life. 
I think is in this around 60. Uh, but, uh, he took me through the last two or three weeks and then, uh, or months of RCA and then, uh, came to the time and said, okay, we're coming up on Holy Week and what we'll do is we'll meet in here and there and now, and we'll do this and do that. We'll do the first confession on Monday night. We'll do this and this, and then Easter vigil, we'll do all this and bring you into the church. There were three or four other people, five other people in the class. Um, I told Father Paul the week before, um, Holy Week, uh, a couple of weeks before I said, uh, I was leaving uh, um, church and I said, you know, Father, appreciate all your help. And and I just, you know, I've learned so much and, and you'll understand this. I said, I don't think I'm yeah. ready. I don't think I'm ready to come in. I think we just need to kind of go slow. Let's slow roll this and give it a few weeks, months, you know, maybe next year, but I'm just not ready. And then the next Sunday I'm leaving mass and, uh, Somehow he stops me, pulls me over, and he, he's, he's about six foot three. Looks down at me and he says, "His name was Paul. Paul in the Louisiana." He says, uh, "He says Gordon, I spoke to your man Paul in Louisiana, and he and I agree that you're more than ready to come into the church." <laughs> he says, "Be here next Monday for confession, and we'll get you into the church the next." You know, the, and so I said, "Okay, I did. I scared to death, scared yeah. to death." The Easter vigil I, service. I was shaking. I was. How was that? Yeah. I, cause I, I had to go through the, um, annulment process too, and wasn't able yeah. to, or did you, yeah. So you it didn't have me, to yeah. do that, time, but then you had to do I it didn't. when your wife joined, right? No, no. It, uh, even before she joined, we had a convalidation ceremony in July of 2015, but before okay. they could do that, um, they said you have to do the nullity process. I was scared to death on that. So I filled out the paperwork, uh, sent the paperwork to my ex-wife, figuring she was going to burn it or throw it or trash it, never respond mm -hmm. to me. She called and yelled at me and said, this is the dumbest thing. This is why the Catholic Church is wrong, and you shouldn't have to do this, and I'm embarrassed. And you should be embarrassed, and you should walk away. And she mailed back the completed papers to me. <laughs> it's like, thank you, Lord, for, yes. for that. Um about three weeks after I turned it into Father Wolf and he said it in the diocese, uh, Father Wolf called me into his office on a weekday and uh, he said the, the canon lawyer at the diocese has, has pronounced that yours is a summary awarding of nullity. Turns out wow. my first wife had been married once before and she was uh, in a valid marriage, valid sacramental marriage and never got divorced. So therefore... Our marriage years even was in sacramental yeah. yeah crazy we we're not uh well she'd been divorced but 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 not in the church right not she, uh, yeah 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 so so i was awarded valid. that i did tell sandy at one point like the day before they got the word back that well, what happens if they don't you know if they don't approve this and 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 i said in words that she didn't understand thank you lord well that means we have to live as brother and sister <laughs> for the rest of our yeah. lives yeah I mean, and, and and I told her, but I don't think she heard it, and uh, which is good. And then uh, I say two years, three years later, our son came into the church. And two years after that, 2019, we moved to Minnesota. I moved to Wisconsin. I took a job over there. And uh, Sandy had been going to Mass with me in Minnesota. She, we got to Wisconsin. She would, she'd go to Mass with me, and then she'd go to a Lutheran service somewhere where she could receive communion. And I mean, back home, when she started, after a few months, she wouldn't go to the Lutheran service. She's going to the Catholic Mass. And mm -hmm. That fall, when the when when um, Father Thorne, uh, our priest there, announced that they were going to start an RCA class in the pew next to me, these announcements at the end of Mass. And yeah. So he says, I'm going to sign up for that. And I about fell, fell out of the pew under the ground there. I was just, where did that come? She said, oh, I just want to learn more about this church. And so, okay, so. She went through an Easter vigil 2019. She was received into the church. And, you know, Praise interesting, God. even her Lutheran background, my Church of Christ and Lutheran background, um, we're just unmoved. We're, we're, we're doing our best not to be cafeteria Catholics, and we're doing our best to be uh, faithful and committed Catholics, even with all the controversy. For some reason, and I, maybe you have a take on this, for some reason the controversy tends to draw us closer to the church. And, and then stronger communion with the church. Um, 
people attacking it and and uh it does I don't know and, if, I, and yeah. my theory on it um i've discussed this with my wife is we're the church that everybody attacks hmm. you don't yeah. hear protests outside the lutheran church there's no protests at the church of christ or the <laughs> methodists or the presbyterians oh. or the anglican it's us and right. for me that's a sign uh that we're we're the ones standing at the gate and uh and we are the place to attack they've already conquered almost every other denomination there oops are, are you frozen oh yeah you're back okay cool i was for a second i'm back now could you hear me yeah. i can okay okay good. i don't see your face moving though so, there oh. you go now you are now you're okay are. yeah and for for me that was i agree with you on that and i think mm -hmm. It was uh, there. There was definitely stuff you had to work through, and then figure out. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was. I, I agree. Yeah, because there was so much, and I ended up when when I was going through my conversion process, there was so much anti-Catholic propaganda that was getting thrown in my face on social media. Mm -hmm. It actually helped strengthen my faith because then I would research all these claims and go, "Oh, those are all bogus." I, I couldn't find one that that had merit um but yeah i agree with you on that yeah for sure mm -hmm. yeah and i mean let's let's face it the, yeah, I'm, the church, I'm impressed that you have the ability to do that the the church didn't start off great right i mean you had one of the apostles portray jesus and then you had the first pope yeah. literally yeah. deny him that's the start of our faith right. so we kind of started really right. low <laughs> so <laughs> um you know you yep. look at it that no way, it's uh like, it is a it's amazing yeah yeah so yeah I so anyway that. that's my my i was received into the church on easter vigil uh 2014 i can remember uh i remember yeah. walking down to receive the eucharist for the first time and that was the first major emotional experience i'd had after after the confession but uh general confession but that just receiving that walking up and and bob often the i remember bob retired insurance guy holding it up and i was just just amazed by that yeah and uh, yeah the um first confession are. for converts is a uh awful one yeah <laughs> it's just nerve-wracking like I, <laughs> I don't know about you uh totally nervous so nervous and, and i'm the type of guy that if I'm doing something I'm really nervous about, but I know I have to do it, I just dive mm -hmm. head first to get it out of the way. It's like ripping a Band-Aid off mm -hmm. was my thought process on it. And so um, we had the option at our parish to either sit in front of the priest or mm -hmm. sit behind the veil. Like we could do either, right. either or the screen and we could do either one. And I was like, for this one, I'm sitting in front of the priest. Like I have to just completely... <laughs> I did the same, you did did the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Father, Father Paul, he's just a magnificent shepherd. He, uh, um, he, he told us all, pulled us all aside the week before the last week of RCIA, the week before and he said, uh, you know, I don't know what he said to the others, but to me, he said, you know, I was coming up on 60 and, uh, he said, uh, uh I, I told him, you know, that I don't think I'm ready. I, got a lot to deal with he says gordon i know you got a lot of life behind you and all that he's in his first general confession he was the one who told me in a roundabout way he says just hit the high points <laughs> he's, i don't need everything he said i i've done this 10 times i've done that 12 times i've done this i've done that and it was wonderful and in the uh it was horrible experience like i said or, or a terrifying experience but i think you'll agree with me too it was the most terrifying and the most uplifting yeah as soon as you as walked out you literally felt the weight oh, off your shoulders you, it you was literally insane. did i yeah i was in front of him i just cried and he uh we got up to leave and he thanked me and uh, he, he's not the emotional huggy type uh, which i like <laughs> but <laughs> we were walking out and he kind of stops me i was facing him and he stepped stands up shakes my hand and uh which i thought was a real overt uh emotion for him but he says going i got one other thing he gave me my penis to do and you never think it's enough, but uh, he's got one other thing to, to tell you. Once he says, the, the one thing you need to do is learn how to forgive yourself. Boy, he was right on that. It took a while. Yeah. 
He says, God uh, forgave as, you. Yeah. I think we all, as Catholic, I think as humans, we we have a really hard time to <laughs> forgiving ourselves for things that we've right. done and our stupidity. Um, and I think that's that's something that we all struggle with. And to know that Christ has forgiven us, our Lord's forgiven mm -hmm. us, so we can do it too. And uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. So with um, so your wife coming in, which is absolutely fantastic that she ended up following yeah, you in. Um, cause I, I've, I know I, that's gotta just be a real struggle. Cause I've talked oh, to several people that have reached out that are kind of in that same boat where they are looking at the Catholic church or they are Catholic and their spouse is in and having to, to balance that. And it's really difficult, but with your son, what ended up, was it just hit? You don't have to go it into was all a, of his details. It was the Holy Spirit story. Well, but, it, but it's just a it's a it's a beautiful story too. I, I tell you, you know, we talk about God sending us to Louisiana. He he sent us to Minnesota, and then in Minnesota, I had a corporate job, um, really good paycheck, and we lived about a block and a half from the Catholic school in town. <clears throat> and I thought, well, we'll send our son to parochial school. Then we were Lutheran. Uh, he walked by our Lutheran church to get to. Holy Redeemer Catholic School in Marshall. And, and he went there from third grade through eighth grade. And Brian, I have to think, um, you know, that's that's where they, you know, where the Holy Spirit, Spirit first entered him the with regards seeds to the were, Catholic Church. Were yeah. Planted yeah. at that point. He uh more than once he'd he'd be all distressed and he'd go running up to the church to pray in front of the grotto of Mary there. And uh wow. And so, you know, but he was still a very Christian kid, very Lutheran kid. Um, he was baptized in Lutheran church. We adopted him as a newborn. Uh, I have an adult daughter from my first marriage. She's 47 this year and, uh, she's Protestant, but our Andrew was, uh, uh, baptized in the Lutheran church, uh, two weeks old and, uh, was raised Lutheran, uh, faithful Lutheran, passionate Lutheran. Uh, one of my favorite stories, we put him in a classical Christian academy for preschool and first grade. And, uh, um, the, 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 pastor at the Lutheran church he went to just loved Andrew because he'd participate in the children's sermon. The pastor called me, he'd have an answer. And after he'd been at classical uh, academy, Christian academy for a few months, the Sunday sermon was about the uh, putting on the armor of God. And, and, and pastor Kurt said, asked the kids, uh, why do we put on the armor of God? And he kind of looks around and he just calls on Andrew knowing Rue would we'll call him Rue. Uh, they knew he'd give him an, an answer and Andrew stands up and, and so why do you, you know, why do you put on the armor of God? And Andrew stood up and says, to protect us from the flaming arrows of hell. And, and I thought that was wonderful. The whole congregation cracked up. Well, here's that way. He went on through very faithful Christian Lutheran, uh, went to university of, uh, we, I took a job his senior year of high school in Laramie, Wyoming. He, uh, on his own choice, he left a state football contending program in Minnesota and came to Laramie, which probably had the worst high school football team in the history of high school football his senior year, but he was seen by the University of Wyoming uh, Cowboy football coaches. Okay. Playing in local, and they asked him, he was a preferred walk on. He came onto that program and I played there for a couple of years. And then when we went to Louisiana, the, the, the apron strings were still tight. And he came down there and uh, Nickel State recruited him, which is very Catholic. It's a public school, but very Catholic. And uh, right. I think all these experiences. We were heading, we used to head up, we were about 50 miles south of him. We head up on weekends on Fridays when he wasn't football season and pick him up, bring him back to Homa with us and uh, spend the weekend. And I was so pumped about being a Catholic that I would share stuff with him and his mom. And one Friday night drive back, Andrew just started yelling or just yelled out, quit telling us about the Catholic church. We don't want to hear, but we're not going to become Catholic. Just stop. <laughs> and his mother, his mother, um, uh, uh, validated that by going, yes, stop. So I just thought that's when after that, where I prayed to the mother Mary and said, you know, work on yeah. it. And then they, they came along. I think though, it was the, the Holy Redeemer Catholic school in Marshall, Minnesota, give him a shout out for that. I'm sure that instilled yeah. something in him. And then he, he finally, um, we went on a, uh, men's retreat one weekend when, after he decided to come into the church and, uh, Emmaus weekend and, uh, uh, he went together and they were asking people to get up and say a few words. And he got up just without us even discussing it. And, and they, uh, they said, why are you coming to church? He goes, two reasons. He says, uh, one is I don't believe Jesus is a liar. When he said, you're Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. <laughs> and he said, if, if it's not true, then Jesus is a liar. And then, uh, 
And then the second thing he said, which just slays me to today, he goes, and I like the way the church has changed my dad. Wow. And he's become a better father and husband uh, for being in the Catholic church. And so that was, that was by better father and husband. He meant I shut up and let the Holy spirit and the blessed Virgin yeah. uh, work on them. And it's just been wonderful. And he married a Catholic girl. Um, they still live in Marshall. Two beautiful little kids. I'd show you a picture, but you know, everybody'd be ashamed of their grandkids if they saw mine. Right, so right. That. Yeah. You might get They're in trouble for that one. So yeah. we don't want that yeah. broadcasting on YouTube. So that is yeah. that is an absolute beautiful story. And I and I don't oh, think it's... you need to say at all that it was um you didn't have to go through the you you did the thinking part second. Um I, yeah. I think <laughs> I think that's uh that that literally is the Holy Spirit and God guiding you through that entire story. And I think that it's absolutely up. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, kind of sketchy. I, yeah. I want to go into uh, what you're doing now. So I think yeah. the mass transit uh, is, is your nonprofit or it's, is go ahead and kind of explain it real quick. What, yeah. what mass well, we're not, transit we're not is. making, we're not making a profit. So, <laughs> right. So I guess yeah, you are yeah. a nonprofit. It's on it. Yeah. We, uh, we're not incorporated. Um, I always wanted to work for my church when I was church of Christ my whole life. You know, people always say, what's your dream job? What's, you know, if you could do any job, what would you, and when I think about it, really think about it, even as a, as a young kid and as a teenager, I want to work for my church. And then it was the church of Christ. And then later on what, you know, for so many years as a Lutheran, I always wanted to work for, for the Lutheran church. I want to do something for my church. And uh, even if it was just that, you know, every, every church, Catholic, Lutheran, Church of Christ, they all have that one guy who always shows up to fix things and do things and mm -hmm. work on things. And if, if he or she weren't there or the couple weren't there, that they, cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars of maintenance. I said, I want to be that guy that yeah. you know comes up and talks everybody's ear off until they're blue in the face and uh, they tolerate him because he's helping the church. I wanted to be, be that guy. So I always want to work for my church. And we started before we... Um, took off in our motor home. We, we live full-time in our motor home, as you know. Uh, I don't think the viewers know that, but we travel around the U.S. from parish to parish doing these videos, episodes on uh, churches. Uh, but first we decided to live full-time on the road when we retired. Uh, that was June 30th of 2022. And, uh, um, and after that, we decided we'd do a YouTube channel. Uh, there's a whole circuitous story about how we decided to do a youtube channel but then it's, i'll do something for the catholic church the original concept of mass transit brian was that i'd go from mass to mass and i'd, I'd film uh uh priests and deacons uh, giving homilies film homilists giving homilies and then sit mm -hmm. down later that day or the next day with them and do a deeper dive i was always impressed by the fact that even the best homilists in the church um, never have enough time to dive in deep. It's not like a Pentecostal church where the right. sermons go on for two hours. For 45 and that, minutes and that the, hour, yeah. the, and, and it's, yeah, it's not the cent, it's not the centerpiece of the mass. Mm -hmm. It's not why we're there. So I always thought that'd be good to do that. And then I have a spiritual director, uh, who's, uh, uh, Canon Mateos. He's with, uh, order, uh, that's a worldwide order. And I've forgotten their names, but he's the St. Mary's oratory in Wausau, Wisconsin. Um, but, uh, I was telling him this idea and he said, Oh, that's very good. Gordon. He's from Brazil. I don't, I don't do his accent. That'd be offensive. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, he says one, one session we had, he says, do me a favor. He says, before you come back next month, he says, go home and look on Facebook and YouTube. A lot of these, most of these parishes around here record their homilies and, and then post them online. Why don't you go watch some of those? And I said, why? Well, just do it and come back see you next month. And, I watched about 20 of them. After about 10 of them, I realized who he was talking about. I went back the next month and he said, well, did you just, yeah, I watched a bunch of them. He said, what'd you see? And I said, I saw that not all priests or deacons are good homilists. <laughs> and, yeah. And that some of them don't have much to dive deep into after that. So we changed the format with mass transit. Now we go from parish to parish who will have us. We spend uh, anywhere from four or more days with them filming uh, all sorts of uh, filming masses and filming classes and filming socials and filming people working uh, at the parish, all aspects of it. If they have a school, we film the school. And then we put together a 15, 16, 17, up to 25-minute episode on that parish 
who are they, what are they, what do they do? We, um, we are, our, our mission is to lift up the Catholic Church by showing the beauty of Catholic parishes, and we do that by showing the beauty of Catholic parishioners. And as you've seen the channel, uh, we started, I think we've done 13 or 14 maybe episodes so far on the parishes. I'm trying to do some short subject stuff in between there to build the channel. We spent uh, four months last summer in, in the Diocese of Boise and filmed parishes all up and down Idaho. Uh, we've published, I think, three of them, and we got four more to publish. Uh, try and put those up once a month. Um, and we filmed the film those and, and just put them up on YouTube, and hopefully we'll build some momentum and build some following where people will go and say, well, that Catholic Church is pretty cool. You know, it's not what we thought it yeah. was. Just kind of show it. And it's the biggest reward of the productions we do are to the parishes themselves, because most all of them take the video and load it on their onto their website and show it to their people. Um, we have an interesting way of paying our way um, with this is when we first started, we thought we'd, we'd charge churches X amount of dollars if you want us to come on to do one of these. And uh, as it turns out, um, we were only getting invited to large parishes, large wealthy parishes, and that kind of tugged on our hearts because we're really drawn to the uh, to the smaller, the smaller parishes. ones. Yeah, and the and the ones that didn't have a lot of resources. So what we do now is it was actually a friend of ours, Mary in 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 Wisconsin, um, who uh, suggests he says, "Why don't you live by faith on this?" So what I mean, she says, "Why don't you just do a free will offerings, second offerings?" And so now we tell parishes that if you want us to come do this, we will. Uh, we ask that you agree to do a second collection or a free will offering the, the weekend after it's premiered on the YouTube channel so they can all see it. And uh, and uh, then, you know, pass to do a second offering. And we've had uh, success with that so far. We just need to do more episodes to build the business and to build the, yeah. the amounts of episodes we're doing. But uh, we, we've had uh, over $4,000 from one parish and uh, – we had one small Hispanic-based uh, food kitchen uh, story that we did where they passed the hat twice and they came back empty. And the pastor, the priest, was so upset about it. And I said, Father, don't that, that's what the Holy Spirit had for us on that. You know, we're, we're, we're yeah. contributing to you with this. Use it. Go with it and all that. And so now we travel around and I've told uh, everybody that we reach out to um, that uh, uh, this is what we ask for. If you want us to come and... Uh, and do this, we actually agree to do a second collection. Um, if and even if a priest called me and say, I want you to come do a film on us, and we're not going to pass the hat, if we can get there and do it, I'm going to do it. Um, uh, we're, we're doing this out of, out of the love of Christ and the love of his church. And uh, I, I think the, the productions are improving. If you look at the first one, you look at the last one we did, we think we're improving. Uh, we spent all last uh, summer, like I said, in the Diocese of Boise. We're heading up uh, this fall after Easter, or the spring after Easter, to the Diocese of New Ulm in Minnesota and hope okay. to spend uh, several months there before we head somewhere else. So we're so looking for that. That is just fantastic. And I think the idea of letting God pay your way, right? I mean, it's the Holy Spirit and you're, yeah. you're, and, yeah. and if you get paid or not, it's like you're the apostles, right? They just work at, work yeah. at building tents outside of town and whatever the Lord can provide. Um, well, you have to learn how to trust in Jesus for sure. Yeah, my my two most regular prayers other than the rosary every morning is uh, I pray a rosary, I pray Divine Mercy Chaplet, which is surrender, kind of a surrender thing. And then I pray the litany of trust every day. And then somebody just sent me last month, I've been praying uh, it's a novena with nine uh, parts to it. I'm on my third one now um, uh, about the surrender novena. Jesus, take care of it kind of thing. And uh, yeah. So it's improving my faith. I'm learning the beauty of poverty isn't being poor. The beauty of poverty is being poor and still loving Jesus and, and still wanting to uphold his kingdom. So. Well, I want to play this this clip that uh, that you sent over sure. from your channel here. So I'm going to go ahead and... A little trailer on our channel, so yeah. Yeah, here, let me go ahead and... Oops. I can't do it. This was screen. done before we left town, so... Okay. Sorry, one second, y'all. Come on, hit play. Hi, I'm Gordon Crow with Mass Transit, a Catholic lay apostolate that produces films on Catholic parish life in America for broadcast on a YouTube channel of the same name. 
The mission of Mass Transit is to share the beauty of the Catholic Church by capturing and sharing the beauty of Catholic parishes. During a recent interview, Deacon Jim Arndt of the Diocese of Superior quite wonderfully captured the calling of Mass Transit. Outlets like Mass Transit can really have the opportunity to really show the beauty of the church, to show the beauty of the Mass, to show the beauty of the parishioners that attend the Catholic churches that Mass Transit has visited. Our target audience includes faithful parishioners, those who don't attend us regularly, fallen away Catholics, and non-Christians seeking a relationship with God. If you would like for Mass Transit to produce an episode on your parish, simply contact us at this email address or by calling us at the phone number listed here. God bless you. Awesome. All right, we're back. That was a couple of years ago, so, uh, but uh, no, we're enjoying it. It's, it's been a real blessing. We stay on a little plot here in Howardwick, Texas, and uh, and uh, learning how to market uh, the YouTube channel. But it's, you know, every church, every parish we visited, a lot of them are multi-church uh, parishes because of the priest shortage. But every one of them has uh, really solidified our faith and really ministered to us in, in great ways. And we have terrific friends wherever we've gone now. Well, I want to say I think it's beautiful what you're doing. I think it's absolutely amazing. Wow. And I mean, yeah, if somebody would tell me what, what your dream job, it'd be able to support my family and working for the church. Like, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, and so I think it's just beautiful that you're trusting in the Lord in this. And um, everybody that's, if you watch this, I please subscribe, go over to Mass Transit, um, watch his videos. If you have a parish that you might want uh, him to come out, reach out and see if, uh, see if you guys can get on his schedule. Um, and I think this is uh, the heart of the Catholic faith is the parishioners. That is the heart of the Catholic faith. And you're showing that in these videos and they're getting, like you said, they're getting better and better. And I think we all, all of us that have ever done YouTube or done anything like this, your first ones you go, uh, but they, you just keep working at it and keep getting better. And I think, uh, I think what you're doing here is amazing. And I really, uh, want uh, this to be just a successful venture for you to where you're just sharing the lives of Catholics and the beauty of a parish and it's it's it, it that that is catholic life is the parish life mm -hmm. and i think it's just absolutely wonderful and i think it's great that you and your wife are doing this and uh so everybody please um subscribe to mass transit i'll have links down below um so that everybody can can get on board and, and put your support behind uh gordon and his wife uh, to be able to to continue this ministry and just spread spread the joy of being Catholic, and that's uh, that that's what he's doing, and we need to support uh, support him on this. So, uh, Gordon, thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I love that we just have really similar backgrounds, and that's we really great. we the, the other day we talked for I think for an hour and a half or maybe yeah. longer just chit chatting. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, really do appreciate it. And, um, so grateful I was able to have you on my channel and I, I hope this brings uh, fruit and uh, we'll just, uh, everyone please pray for Gordon and his ministry and, uh, may the Holy spirit continue to guide him and, and uh, and the Lord provide to yeah. just spread our Catholic faith further. And thank God so. for Methodist and Lutheran wives. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen okay. for that. Awesome. God bless you, Brian. I love your ministry too. And uh, we're all on a quest for faith, a quest of faith and a quest for faith. And and I love what you're doing too. And I similarly hope that uh, uh, everybody who sees this is a subscriber to yours and supports your ministry. Thank you. God bless you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it, Gordon. Like, share, and subscribe. Share this video so more and more people can see Mass Transit. Thank I appreciate you. it, guys. Have a good one. God bless.